Can we stand together one more time? How many of you need to see God make a way in your life? How many of you need to see God do something that's going to take faith? Part of my responsibility as your pastor is to encourage your faith. This morning, I want us to sing in preparation for the Word of God this morning. The Bible says in Hebrews that the Word of God was preached to them, but it did not profit them. The Word of God was preached to them. They heard the Word, but it didn't do them any good. Do you know why? Because the Bible said it was not mixed with faith. Hello? Without faith, you cannot receive from God. So let's let faith rise up this morning. Whatever your need is, whatever your mountain is, your mountain might have a different name than mine. But it's still a mountain to you. It's still a limitation. It's still a block. It's still a hindrance. But God still moves mountains. But it's only by faith. So as we prepare to hear the word, let's mix some faith in there. Come on, let's mix, let's stir up some faith this morning. What a shame, what a travesty to just come to church and not hear from God and not receive something from God. Life is too challenging to go it alone. Life is too hard to do it on your own. But by God's grace, by God's strength, we can make it through. Let's believe these next just five minutes as we sing this song preparation to hear God's word. Let's sing, He is a way maker. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You 
Come on, let's pray right now. Whatever your need is, come on, let's pray right now for the way maker. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we come into agreement. We pray that faith would come alive in the hearts of your people to believe you because we know the power of faith this morning. We know the power when we trust in you and believe you, Lord, to make a way for your people, God. Lord, touch your people this morning. Minister to every need, Lord. Every mountain we believe to be removed. God, every valley to be brought up, every crooked path to be made straight. Lord, we lift up the church, the body of Christ, the people of God. Let healing flow in this body. Lord, over sick bodies, we remember Pastor Mike and Pastor Tara and the children. Lord, minister to them this morning, God. Minister healing to them. Encourage their hearts today. God, we thank you for your people. God, we thank you for every person here and those that might be sick that we're not aware of. Lord, you know who they are. Minister to them in the power of the blood of Jesus. In the power of Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we commit every need into your hands and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name and everyone said amen and amen. Before you're seated one more time, greet the person next to you. Welcome them. Bless them. Amen, amen. Good to see you here this morning. Uh, we uh, want to welcome a uh, minister from Liberia, Pastor DeBoer. Would you just stand? God bless you. God bless you. We welcome you here this morning. Amen. We welcome anyone visiting for the very first time. We want to welcome all our guests. Is there anyone here that you'd just like to acknowledge? Uh, we don't want to put you on the spot or anything. But if you are visiting, guest here, anyone? Welcome, welcome, welcome. God bless you, God bless you. We want to remember Linda. Linda, would you stand? God bless you. She's going to actually be leaving for London for uh, several months. We're going to miss you. Please keep, keep Linda in prayer. God bless you. Amen, amen. Would you open up in your Bibles this morning? We want to look into the Word of God. We're going to look in Luke chapter 22 and also in 1 Peter chapter 1. My message this morning is, your faith is valuable. Your faith is valuable. I want to show you through the scriptures this morning how valuable, how critically important your faith is is in Luke chapter 22 I want to read a couple of verses of scripture to you in the gospel we have Matthew Mark Luke and John Matthew Mark and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels if you ever heard that saying what that simply means is similar or the same Matthew Mark and Luke follow the same uh, narrative uh, very similar, so they're called the Synoptic Gospels. John's Gospel is, is much different, doesn't have as many parables or stories as are in the other three. So there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and we are looking at... Thought I tricked some of you, but you're tracking with me. You're doing well this morning. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, this is Jesus, Simon... Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Turn with me, turn over a few books towards the end of the Bible. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 7. This is the same Peter that Jesus just spoke to. This is the same apostle. And he writes after many dangers, toils, and snares that he went through, after he had been through what Jesus had spoken about, had grown and matured, the Holy Spirit inspired him 
to write this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter was saying, after many years, as his faith had been tested and tried and developed, speaking inspired by God to write this to us, he said, your faith is much more precious than gold. Oh, I wish some of you would believe that this morning. We believe that gold is much more precious. Oh, come on, don't look at me all so sanctified or else I'll take another offering and see how much you believe. If I held up two bags, one filled with gold and the other filled with trials that test your faith, which one would you choose? Oh, Lord, help me to preach this morning. Help me to have some believers here that really believe the word of God. Your faith, Jesus told Peter, I pray that your faith would not fail. Peter would later write that your faith is much more precious than gold. If it's much more precious than gold, you ought to protect it. You ought to prize it. You ought to cherish it. You know, you, you protect and you cherish what you value. You know, you don't have security cops surrounding your garbage cans. Right? You just put them out on the street and you wait for the garbage man. You don't look out your window. Is anybody stealing my garbage? Matter of fact, I put things out. You know, you're not sure if the garbage man's going to take it. And I'm looking out the window and I'm praying, Lord, touch, Lord, let him take that. Let him get that out of here. I'm waiting on that garbage man. He's taking my regular garbage. But, you know, if something isn't the right size, they don't necessarily want to take it. I don't know what happened to garbage man. They got lazy. But, but you just throw things out and some things are just not important not valuable, and, and, you know, I've got some things in my life, you know, and here I got a check right here, you know, this is a check, it's a real check, but you know what? It, it's worth two cents. For real. Two cents. Why does a Capital One even waste the stamp and the printing to send out a check to reimburse me for two cents? Two pennies. But it doesn't matter because it's only worth two cents. But your faith is much more precious. It's, it's, it's like gold in God's eyes. Go back to Luke chapter 22. Some of you thought I was getting crazy. My son was looking at me, thought it was a check for 100 saying, Dad, why didn't you just give that to me? <laughs> it's only two cents. Don't lose your salvation, anybody, this morning. <laughs> Luke chapter uh, 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. You know, in this passage of Scripture, we have something so profound. Jesus, he pulls back the curtain into the spirit realm. And he gives a revelation. He, he lets Peter in on something that Peter would not have known because it wasn't in the natural. It was in the spirit realm. And, and we can't see into the spirit realm unless God gives us vision or unless God pulls back the curtain. And, and Jesus did something so profound. He pulled back that curtain and he said, I want you to know something, Simon. Satan has asked for you. He wants to sift you as wheat. And, and in that passage of scripture, in that, that, that metaphor or that, that uh, analogy, what was that? The, the, when, when, you, when you sift wheat, it's, it's, a, it's a chafing uh, and a breaking away of, of that which is, is not useful or necessary so that the grain that is good might remain. And, and it's an agitation process. And really what, what Jesus was saying that you are about to go through some grinding, some, some agitation. You're about to be put 
through a most difficult time. Satan wants to do that to you. Now, if you notice, the scriptures say Satan asked. Do you know that is, is kind of making, uh, it brings us back to Job chapter 1. If you remember the story of Job, that, that Satan had to ask God's permission to tempt Job, to go put Job through the greatest trials of his life. So I want you to understand something this morning, that Satan could only go so far, he must ask for permission. He's not the one who's in control, God's in control. He might put you through a fire, but God has his hand on the, the knob and the degrees and the temperature. And so we see the similar terminology. We see that as Job, as Satan tried to uh, ask God's permission to tempt Job, we see right here in this passage of Scripture, we see Satan is asking for permission to go after the disciples, especially Peter. Here we have a spiritual attack of the devil. And there is a revelation here, and there is a, it is further uh, uh, explained in other scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces and wickednesses in high places. The Bible tells us that we have an adversary called the devil who goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And here we have... A spiritual attack meant to bring about Peter's total destruction. John 10.10 10 tells us the thief, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief comes. The devil comes. His purpose is what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Notice it's steal first. I think that's instructive. I think that's significant. What is the devil trying to steal? He's trying to steal your faith. He's trying to steal your faith. If the devil could rob Peter of his faith, he would be finished. If the devil could rob you this morning of your faith, you're finished. You're finished. You see, every, everything you receive in life, in your spiritual life, is by faith. That's why the enemy of your soul is after your faith. That's why Peter would later write that your faith is much more precious than gold. Imagine if we cherished our faith like we do gold, like we do tangible things, like we do money, status, position, Material blessings, if we only cherished our faith like gold, because it is like gold, it's much more precious. Why? Because it's faith is everything. You can't be saved without faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By faith you're saved. Through grace, not of yourself, that is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's by faith you're saved. Simply believing in God's word and his promises. You can't live without faith. The Bible tells us in four different places, in Habakkuk in the Old Testament, in Galatians, in Hebrews, in Romans, the just shall live by faith. That's how you live. That's how I live. We live by faith. You can't overcome without faith. 1 John 5, 4 says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith, amen. Faith is what pleases God. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible. Can I say it any other way? It is impossible. You know what it means in the Greek? Impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What is faith? Faith is total dependence upon God that becomes supernatural in its outworking. Faith is taking God at his word. 
Faith is a childlike trust in the risen supernatural Christ. Nothing touches the heart of our Heavenly Father as much as when His children simply trust Him wholeheartedly. Faith. Faith. We, we trust in God wholeheartedly. We believe it is so even when it isn't so because God said so. Oh, that was too deep for you on a Sunday morning. Faith believes it is so even when it isn't so because God said so. You know, faith in, in, in the Old Testament, faith is mainly seen in the New Testament, but faith in the Old Testament is the word trust. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Trust. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. But the word faith in the New Testament is where we get the, the root word for amen. Every time you say amen, you're expressing faith. Oh, I thought you'd be a little quicker on the draw. Amen. What does amen mean? Certainly. It means so shall it be. It means it will be. It means you can count on it. You see, for Peter, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Do you know Peter was going to fail? Do you know that Peter failed? Do you know he failed miserably? But Jesus didn't necessarily pray for that because we will fail. But he prayed that his faith would not fail. Come on, how many of you are still with me? But I have prayed for you. Imagine the intercession, the prayers of Jesus. You know the Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for us? Hallelujah. Come on, that ought to make you crack a smile. Amen. He ever lives to make intercession. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father ever interceding, interceding by his life, his death, by the cross, and pleading his precious blood over our lives that you and I can make it. Let me tell you, you don't realize it, but there is an enemy that is bent on your destruction. And you know what? If only God would pull back the curtain. I'm thankful he doesn't because I think some of us would be scared spitless. To see what's going on in the spiritual realm. How the devil, how the enemy of your soul is bent on destroying you and dragging you to hell. The psalmist said, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. When men rose up against us, they would have destroyed us. You see, this gives us insight. The enemy of our soul is after our faith. He comes to steal. You see, what does the devil come to steal? Oh, he's come to steal our money. No, he don't need your money. He come to steal your car. He don't drive. He's come to steal your health. No, he's a spirit being. He's come to steal your faith. Don't misunderstand me. He, he, he will go after those other things, but it's all for a means of robbing your faith. You see, if you lose money, if the devil steals your money, if you've got faith, you can get it back. You can recover. You see, if the devil it tries to steal your health, if you've got faith, you can get whole again in Jesus' name. If you have your stuff taken by faith, you will recover all. But if you've got no faith, if your faith is robbed as a Christian, you're lifeless. No word from God. If you have no faith, even as a Christian, you're lifeless. You go through the motion. There's no expectation of God doing something. No hope of anything good happening. You see, if you're not living in faith, if the devil gets at your faith and chews it away and erodes your faith and your confidence in God, you begin to live a life of, of, of what, 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 is, what is the opposite. It's fear. 
What is fear? Fear is belief that negative is going to happen. Fear is faith going in reverse. Fear is believing that nothing good is going to happen. And how many Christians live under that? Why? Because the enemy has worked on little by little, degree by degree, eroding your confidence, your faith, your trust in God. Let me tell you, if you're trusting in the person that's sitting next to you, woe is you. He might be cute. She might be cute. He might have a lot of money. He might be good looking. All those things. But let me tell you, you can't trust in that because there's going to come a time in your life when you're all alone and no one can help you but God. If you're trusting in your job, if you're trusting in your bank account, listen, it's a sad thing to equate your self-worth with your net worth. Some people live for the bottom dollar. Some people live for how much they could acquire. But let me tell you, when you're in need, you can't, you can't get help from those things. You've got to trust in God. You've got to have faith in God. You've got to believe and not live in fear. Faith is taking God at his word that he will do what he said he'll do. Fear is faith in the negative. Instead of faith, we, we walk in fear. And we, you know, if you begin to speak negative and you begin to rehearse negative, you know what? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're calling things into existence by your words. You're, you're, you're causing a cloud over your life. Do you ever find that to be true? You start to get negative, then before you know it, the whole, the whole sky is black. You know, you get a little negativity, and before you know it, everything, you're negative about everything. There was some grandchildren that they wanted to play a trick on their grandfather. And while he was sleeping, the grandchildren got out the smelliest cheese they can find in the refrigerator. And while the grandfather's sleeping, they got the cheese and they rubbed it all on his mustache. When the grandfather woke up, he said, something stinks in this room. He went into the other part of the house, and wherever he went, he says, man, this, this whole house stinks. Then he opened the door. He went outside. He said, the whole world stinks. That's what happens when you get a bad attitude. You begin to project that on everything. You get negative. You come to church, and you get negative about everything. You get negative about this, negative about that. Everything's negative. And before you know it, it clouds up everything. Before you know it, the whole world stinks. See, we can't live that way, discouraged, defeated, downtrodden. Many Christians, though, they, they come to church, there's no joy. There's no worship. There's no vibrancy. But I have good news for you this morning. God can restore your joy. God can revive your worship. God can give you a newness and a freshness in your experience with him. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. How did Peter return? How did he get strengthened? How did he get back at it? How did he get back in the game? By faith. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. Again, Peter got further revelation by, by the experience, the things he went through in life. You see, God does not waste anything you go through. If you trust in him, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and those that are the called according to his purpose. Everything you've been through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, God can use if you trust him. And for Peter, he learned some lessons. And he got further revelation. And look what he writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What is he doing? He's, he's telling you a little bit of his testimony. He's testifying. He's saying, you know what? There's a devil. I don't just know this theoretically. I know this experientially because I've been through it. I know what it is to be, to be almost devoured. 
But how did I deal with it? Look what he said in verse 9. Resist him. How do you resist the devil? Not in your own strength. None of us are that strong. None of us are that clever. None of us are that wise. None of us have it in our own strength. How do we do it? We resist him by faith. Steadfast in the faith. You tell the devil, no, not today. Come on, have you heard that song yet? Come on, tell the devil, no, not today. Not tomorrow, not ever again. What do you do? The Bible says you resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. That's why it's so important to come to church and be a part of a body and be in community with other believers because you begin to realize you're not the only one going through it. I know you think you are. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm the only one, Pastor. No one loves me. No one cares. No one calls me. No one nothings. The world stinks. But you're not the only one that feels like that. You look at some people even in ministry in this church that serve faithfully day after day, week after week, year after year, and you say, oh, you know, they, they must have an easy life. No, they just have a strong faith. They just have a faith that they're not going to let the devil steal, but they're going to keep on believing. They're going to keep on believing. And you know what I got to do? I got to keep on believing. Through discouragement, through setback, through people coming, through people going, I still got to believe. Because my faith is not in people, my faith is in God. Amen. We've got to get our eyes off of people, we've got to get our eyes on God. God is your supplier, not people. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings, what does that tell us? It tells us we're all under attack. We're all under attack. If you remember, I wish I had the video clip, 9-11. If you remember, our president was sitting in a classroom reading books to fourth graders or fifth graders, George W. Bush. And one of his staff members came in from the back of the room and whispered in his ear. If you remember that image. Do you know what he, you know what he whispered in his ear? We are under attack. We are under attack. The towers have been hit. We're under attack. Do you know, brothers and sisters, you can whisper in each other's ear, you're under attack. We are under attack. The devil hates anything and anyone that looks, resembles anything that looks like God and looks like Jesus. Why? Because that's a reminder of what he lost out on and that's a reminder of his doom. And he hates and he attacks you and I to chew away, to eat away, to erode our faith because he wants to destroy us. If you have no faith, you're done. That's why Jesus would tell the crowds, he would plead with them, he would say, only believe, only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Brothers and sisters, you are under attack. He will use any and every available means. He will use things you don't even realize. He, the devil is a master at covering his tracks. You won't even realize that you're under attack. You won't even realize. You, you think it's a person, but the Bible says we don't wrestle with people. We don't fight with flesh and blood, but our battle is with principalities and powers. But the Bible says be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You may be able to stand against the schemings and the strategies of the devil. The Bible says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. That's why we got to get some wisdom. We got to know the word of God for ourselves because in, when you're all alone, you ain't got, you're not going to have your mama or your daddy fighting with you. You're going to have to stand for yourself and you're going to have to stand fast and stand firm in the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I pray that your faith would not fail. Then when you, are, when you return to me and you could strengthen your brethren. See, this morning you have to resist his lies, and I'm almost done. You have to resist his lies. Peter failed. He not only denied knowing Jesus after walking with him three and a half years. He not only denied, he left him. He fled. When the chips were down, he fled. Not only denied him, but then he, he cursed. 
And he swore, I don't know. And he said, I'm not his disciple. He denied knowing Jesus, following Jesus, and being his disciple. That's pretty low. Peter, you failed. But if you can just keep your faith a little bit longer. If you can just hold on in faith through the night. Weeping indoors for a night, but joy is going to come. It might be, it might be Good Friday, but, but Sunday's coming. Resurrection's coming. You might have failed, Peter, but if you can just remember the word. What did Jesus say to you? He said, when you, are, when you return, when you're strengthened, hallelujah, hallelujah, strengthen your brethren. What was Jesus doing? He was prophesying his future. He was saying, listen, Peter, you're going to come back. You're going you're, you're gonna to fail, but your faith is not going to fail because I'm praying for you. And this morning, you need to understand that, that you can return to God. You could come back from your backslidden state. You might have sunk so low and done some things you said you would never do, and you wonder, can God forgive you? I want you to know God can forgive you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You can return and you will be a strength to other people. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Not only does he restore you, but he'll use you. Not only does he make a way for you, but he blesses you. You see, he let faith come alive. Maybe he remembered what Jesus said. Maybe he remembered a proverb that said, A righteous man falls seven times, but the Lord upholds him. He gets back up again. Maybe Peter was thinking, I can get back up again. This morning you might feel, I've wasted so much time living for the world, living for the flesh, living for the devil. What use is it? There's a promise for that. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years. The locust, the caterpillar, have eaten. What was that? God says, my great army that I sent among you. You see, the caterpillar was a plague that devastated the land of Israel. It was a judgment from God because of the sins of the people. They rightfully deserved it. But you know what God said in his goodness? He said, I'll restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. What you deserve, what you had coming to you. God said, I'm going to restore your life. I'm going to make a way for you. I'm going to bless you better than you thought could happen. Somebody ought to shout amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will restore to you the years. God said, I'm going to make up for lost time. I was reading about a woman who was molested by her father from the ages of 6 to 13. She turned to drugs and alcohol. She began to work at a club, and that led to stripping. That led to man after man. Her life was totally devastated. Obviously, you understand, she had thoughts of suicide. She went to a church as a last resort. Didn't think she had a hope, but the word of God was preached. The word of God was preached. Faith came alive. She trusted Christ with her life. She was forgiven. She, she, she felt and sensed the cleansing of the blood of Jesus that washed her sins away. And she was changed by the power of God. Now this woman is saved, serving God, attending a church in New York City. Why? Because she, with just one grain of mustard seed of faith, Believe that there was a hope. Believe that there was a savior. Believe that she could be forgiven. Believe that her life could be changed. You see, the devil is out to steal your faith. When you get offended, listen to me. When you get hurt in church, when you get offended because somebody did something or didn't do something or they thought they did, you thought they did, they didn't. Whatever it is. When you begin to miss church, when you begin to stop reading your Bible and you begin to pull away. See, the devil wasn't after, just didn't want to make you bitter. He wanted you to lose your faith. He wanted you to miss out on coming to church. He wanted you to miss out on the fellowship of other believers so he can get you. He can rob your faith. He wasn't just trying to get you offended. 
Think about some of the things people get offended. Some of the stupidest, smallest little things they get offended and they stop coming to church and the devil's laughing at you. When you get caught up with work, trying to make more money, chasing money. The devil isn't necessarily trying to get you into idolatry. He's trying to rob your faith. He's trying to get you to have no time for the word of God. No time to, you're too tired to pray. I can't pray. I work 16 hours every day. I sleep one hour a day. Well, that's too much. If you're too busy and you're too tired for God, you're too busy. I could see that went over well. See, the devil is trying to cut off your lifeline to God. Your lifeline to God is purely by faith. Purely by faith. When you come under attack emotionally and physically, some of you are battling emotional things from your past. You're battling the weight and the pressure of family stuff. Listen, no family's perfect. Just invite me to your family reunion and I'll be able to testify of that. I don't care who you are. I've been around some great people in the eyes of the world and they've got some characters in their family. They've got some knots in their family tree. The reality of it is we face things emotionally and the devil's plan is to wear you down, to wear you out, to tire you, to weaken your faith so that you give up. You see, the devil's not just after you, he's after your kids. He's after the next generation. He's after the people that you influence. The songwriter, the hymn writer said, Lord, oh, give me the strength. I'm going on, I'm going on with you. Give me the strength because so many lives depend on what I do. Do you realize so many lives depend on what you do? Your children, your grandchildren, the next generation, your friends, your family. If you can get so worn down and your faith becomes so weak, you give up. Make some choices to position yourself to grow in your faith. Would you stand together with me this morning? You need to make some choices to make the growth of your faith, the protection of your faith, your faith is valuable. Turn to the person next to you and say, you've got to protect your faith. You've got to protect your faith. It's your lifeline. The choices you make are critical. You say, I can make any old choices. You know what? The choices you make, make you. The choices you make, make you. Do you make choices to sit in the presence of God on a regular basis? To commune with your heavenly father, your creator, the one who loves you. To grow in your faith. Your faith will be tested. Your faith is going to be tested. Someone said a faith that has not been tested is a faith that not, cannot be trusted. You want to grow in your faith? You're going to be tested. I got good news for you. Good news and bad news. The bad news is you're going to be tested. The good news is your faith is going to grow. See, your faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the more it grows. I want to conclude this morning encouraging you to make your faith. You, would, you wouldn't tear up a check worth 10000 50000 or 100000 It's too valuable. Don't throw your faith away. Don't discard it. It's too valuable. It's much more precious than gold. If you and I really believed that, we would make our faith a priority. If we really believed it, we would be intentional about growing. We would be in church regularly. We would come on Wednesday nights. We would pray regularly. Not as a list of rules and do's and don'ts, but out of relationship with God because I want to grow in my faith. I get offended, I get hurt, but you know what? I rise up to believe God's word.
God's word says, if I don't forgive, <laughs> he ain't forgiving me. I don't know if people get offended even though that verse exists, because that's a pretty powerful verse. If I get discouraged and downcast, I realize I'm not the only one going through. When I think I've committed something to God and I've given to God and I've sacrificed to God, let me tell you, there are some people who have done some crazy sacrifices. Did you hear on the news? 26-year-old guy went to the islands. Was it in uh, Indian Islands somewhere? To preach Jesus to a people group that had never been reached. And he was martyred. He was killed. It's been all over the news. If you just Google it, it'll come up. 26 years old. You know what he wrote in his diary? He said, I'm afraid to die. He says, but I'll do this for the glory of God because preaching Jesus is worth it. What, a, what, a, what an indictment to most Christians. What a challenge to you and I this morning. Here's someone who gave his life to preach the gospel. Can we give our life to grow in our faith, to honor God? Can we sing and close. I'm going to sing one song, then I'm going to pray with you, but can you can you be challenged this morning to make your, the growth of your faith a priority? As we sing this morning, I'm going to pray. No one leave. Maybe you come to these altars and just, just surrender yourself and just trust in Jesus. Whatever's holding you back, please believe me, it's not worth it. Whatever is hindering your faith, please believe me, it's not worth it. But would you make that decision today? Say, God, I'm struggling. God, I'm hurting. God, I don't understand. But you know what? I'm going to trust in you with all of my heart. I'm not going to lean. Come on, some of you are leaning on your own understanding. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. But in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge God. And he's going to direct my paths. Let's sing that. If you want to come, kneel at your seat. Kneel at these altars. And then we're going to pray in closing.